as you would see from the title, Conversation Game Change, Innovation Shaping the Future of Green Technology. In this particular discussion, the concentration will be on biotechnology. And of course, biotechnology is a very broad term, but our two panelists will concentrate, I guess, on the genetic modification, recombinant DNA technology, and associated technologies which have opened up some unusual opportunities in terms of crop, animal, microbial improvement. It's also called the future of green technology. Uh, the green word is now widely used, particularly after Rio plus 20. Uh, everywhere we would like to see the word green, in other words, which is environmentally benign, which is environmentally uh, sound and would help to uh, promote what you call sustainable development. In other words, development uh, without having to look back afterwards. There are, in the case of biotechnology, there are six major issues in terms of green technology, which are aired in many meetings, particularly non-governmental organizations. The first is the environmental impact of biotechnology or ecological factors. The two issues which are of great concern today in our discussion will be both uh, biodiversity, impact on biodiversity, and also in terms of preparation for climate change. What, what contributions can biotechnology make for us to be able to cope with the new challenges in ensuring sustainable food security. The second is economics, the cost risk return structure of technology, which is one what is in the previous section, there was a lot of talk about small holders and so on. For them, the most important thing is the cost risk and, and return structure of farming. Now, there is a lot of question about intellectual property rights, the high cost of technology, the lack of adequate insurance so that farmers are not protected when the rains fail and so on. So the economic aspects of green technology become important. The third are the equity aspects, both social and gender. Gender in terms of women, uh, any, either pro-woman, or there are problems in terms of technological improvement. Inclusiveness and access to technology. Because if you see the Rio plus 20, it is not only green technology, but green technology for inclusive growth so that nobody is left out. All, all benefit from technological transformation. That's an important one uh, so that this technology does not become a divider but a unifier. The fourth E, in fact, the previous lecturer, Kendall Powell, rightly mentioned innovation and share. He used the word innovate and share. The next important question which concerns any technology in developing countries is the question of employment. Is it a pro-job-led growth or jobless growth? Because employment, even in this country, I find the debates relate very highly on employment issues. If that is so, in most of the developing countries with the high population pressure, employment is very important. Lastly, energy issues are always Energy, in the case of biotechnology, there is a lot of work going on in different institutions on converting C3 plants into C4 plants so they become more, more, more effective in terms of utilizing sunlight. To what extent, so this green biotechnology, to what extent can contribute in terms of uh, ecological uh, sustainability, uh, economic sustainability, social sustainability, and uh, above all, can it generate more jobs? And also, can it be much more energy efficient? And are the current, current attempts to convert a plant like rice, there's a lot of work at the International Rice Research Institute on converting rice into a C4 plant. These are many, many, there's many other challenging issues. We have two outstanding uh, members of the panel. I need hardly introduce you to Bob Fraley the Executive Vice President and Chief Technology Officer of Monsanto, which has been a pioneer in the whole area of technology development. Uh, not only biotechnology, but many of the areas of technology. And of course, Mark van Wantago is one of the fathers of modern uh, biotechnology, one of the early inventors of the methods of uh, transmission of genes uh, through vectors, agrobacterium tumefaciens. He and Jeff Shell did a remarkable job so I call upon both of them, first Mark Van Montagu, uh, to say what he wants to say on the topic is shaping the future of green technology, 
with, but we are concentrating on biotechnology. Then, of course, Bob Fraley will pass, and then we'll have a, because our t time is very limited, I find, hardly 40, 45 minutes have been given for this session. So I will straight away, when they, they, when they too complete the presentation, I'll open it up to the floor. Mark. Thank you. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Uh, yes, uh, if I can have the first slide. Of where is this? Yeah, I uh, so, thought the title, Game Change, is very appropriate. And my talk itself, formal talk, I would call Discover, Innovate, and Communicate, because that are the three important points. All my life I was in the public sector at the University of Ghent, so I was at the Discover side, but I tried to uh, contribute at the innovation and communication side. So, is this the signal for having slight changes here? Next, please. Don't see any. That's the. Th okay, go back. Sorry. First, didn't touch it. Okay. Uh, um, we take our planet uh, for granted to have these landscapes. We know the importance of uh, flowering plants, but at the moment with the ever-increasing population growth and all the pressures that it brings on pollution, on environment, and on the products uh, we need uh, for our world, the challenges are enormous. And we cannot enough try to see how to apply science to, do, to see what we can save, how we can get organized uh, for the immediate future. Rio Plus 20 this year uh, was very explicit. They restated the Millennium Goals and phrased it very concretely. F we have to stop hunger, we have to stop poverty, and we have to stop deforestation. And that are the three core points that we see how science uh, can contribute there. So science and technology in for sustainable agriculture, because that's what the real problem is. And all this ecology, we have to see what is the molecular base of the development of plants and, and of the, uh, the plant communities uh, that we have. And we have to see uh, what are the challenges. The challenges are at three levels. We talk a lot today of food and feed production, but we also have to realize that in the future, with shortage of petroleum, Plants will be the raw material for our chemical industry. This science is fully developing. We have a lot of new products coming up, but also uh, for all our plastics, we will have to see that the initial products come from plants. So we will have now to have increased biomass production on the same amount of arable land, part of it for food, uh, and sometimes we hope in the future from the same plant that we can develop and that uh, uh, what we call now agriculture waste and later on city waste and the food that we didn't use, that it can be reused for a fermentation industry, for a chemical industry, low energy that makes the product. And most of all, at the level of environment, we, ha we know that the physical and chemical solutions are too expensive. We have to see how, with, with our innovation in plant molecular genetics, how can we contribute to make plants that we have less uh, polluting agriculture, less po uh, more sustainable uh, world than we have now. The picture there is the Gulf of Mexico, uh, the zones of anoxia that are created with the excess of fertilizers coming from the Mississippi River. So that are the challenges. What did we do till now? Well, it was not so brilliant. Uh, our society, since a long time, need a lot of products for industry, 
we need rubber for the tires, the, we need the palm oil. Whole Malaysia has been chopped off, the for, tropical forest, uh, the population disseminated who was living there because our industry needed it. But we did it in the classical way with trees, with breeding, palm oil trees, well, 35 years when you make crosses, 35 years for before flowering. So there's an enormous task for fundamental science uh, to progress there. And we hope we will, we will be able to do it. That's why I'd say discovery. Yes, agrobacterium was a good start, but we found it just by looking for something else. What was cancer on plants? What was this tumor purification? And that's an interesting science that is absolutely going on. Uh, the, what is in the plant genome to do this cell proliferation? But immediately we left the fundamental and tried to do the innovations, to do the applications. So uh, this, this photograph there is genetic engineering for making hybrid canola, for making male sterility. Plant scientists all discovered these items in the last uh, 20 years. This uh, male sterility in, uh, through genetic engineering has not been used because meanwhile uh, society reacted against GMOs and the costs for introducing uh, new uh, GMOs were too much too expensive and therefore that at the moment I will mostly stress communication to society because if the society doesn't accept the innovations that plant scientists can bring it will be dramatic and I can assure you that the fundamental science is going fantastically well uh, that's a uh, tribute to Beijing Genomics Institute by making, developing DNA sequencing methods uh, and really information handling out coming out of that. So that now they do about uh, an equivalent of 150 human genomes a day as sequencing. So that allowed them to do the uh, sequencing of all these plants, contribute to the functional genomics to identify the RNAs that are expressed and to really an analyze what's going on. And the fundamental scientists, meanwhile, discovered the importance of epigenetics. Uh, we will have pretty soon uh, better understanding of hybrid vigor. A lot of uh, signals that are in so-called junk DNA, those who follow the publications of ENCODE in Nature in earlier, uh, early September and in other journals know that we 80% of the human genome is made of signals for gene regulation that we, only now we are discovering so fundamental science will do the, uh, and able, will be able to take enormous challenges there uh, I have not the slightest doubt but what we have to do is to apply to innovation. And there it's important that these scientists talk better with the plant breeders, with people who know agriculture, because phenomics on, among all the omics technologies that are there is the most crucial. Look to the phenotypic trait, see the decisions that can be taken rapidly, and see what molecular biology already can tell us and what we can do. Because indeed, Plants have an enormous potential. People have communicated that for, uh, for corn, maybe it could be go to 65 tons uh, per acre, but it goes for many, many crops. Give you just a symbol uh, for bananas. Uh, most cultivation of bananas have 10 kilogram uh, per banana tree. In the plantations you go, uh, Doyle and, uh, and the different companies go to 24, but in Costa Rica, in Cati, and together with what Sven did at the Catholic University of Leuven in Belgium, uh, they have uh, tetraploid ba bananas where they have 230 kilograms per tree. So yield potential is there, how to handle it, how to exploit it. Final solution for agriculture, of course, is political will, is good governance. But R&D can do a lot. If we see in Brazil, 
wat u in Brabant kunt doen, een state company that does fundamental research, applied research, and really the applications in agriculture. It could be a model for quite some uh, developing countries if this good governance uh, could proceed that these companies do this work. So they could recently, through genetic engineering, make beans disease resistance that are important for a million poor farmers. In India, there is the enormous discussion around brinjal. We know that the herbicide, uh, uh, sorry, that the pesticide that is used for the insect uh, uh, in, uh, for brinjal is really very dangerous. We have the solution with the BT. How, why don't we use it? And all, if you talk to people who work on biotic stress, it's enormous what fundamental science has learned but through the uh, genomics technology on the evolution of the genome and to see how uh, uh, microorganisms cope with challenging environment. Well, it will be ch the same for the, uh, for the plants. We know that the genes that give disease resistant are only temporarily functioning that pathogens can take over. And this battle goes on. But no, we cannot no longer wait. Now that we have analyzed, that we wait how this interplay goes, we have really to use the capacity we have to make, identify 10, 20 interesting genes and to make the necessary synthetic genes. We know that plant disease by, can be controlled by um, uh, molecular geneticists. And we have to see that we can apply it. And at that moment, we will really progress. We know that the number of crops that we use are very limited and that there are fascinating orphan crops around, like Latyrus, that's in a picture uh, of Ethiopia, where under drought conditions, it's a leguminous plant, grass pea, uh, that this crop, if could, we could remove a toxic compound that is, and that's only uh, attacking uh, the cells um, for our neuro, for the, the nerve cells of the lower limbs when the uh, male persons are about 45, 50 years. But most of it, uh, if you can remove it and turn it into a crop and understand why this crop has called the miracle crops already 4,000 years ago. We find the seeds in the tombs of the pharaohs in Bangladesh after three months of flood. The, crop that comes up again is again Latyrus. So this should be studied and we should have pot uh, possibilities. So innovation will be to talk also on the orphan crops. But we have to see how to organize our society. The fundamental sector, the public sector goes well, but society asks where are the innovations? And the innovations are uh, blocked because there is not always the political will, the financial support uh, to do this innovation. So therefore, we have to communicate. And if we to talk to society, we see that in Europe, all over, and the last Seralini paper is the same, says it's dangerous. But there is not the slightest proof that it was dangerous, and there have been many false publications that came out, and that have been endorsed by political groups. And that's what we have to do. Then if uh, this uh, attitude seems to fade out, but with Seralini, it is uh, again, it gets a push and people immediately do, uh, accept it. But then meanwhile, they said it's bad for environment. But again, not a slightest argument has been seen that it is dangerous for environment. People think it's unnatural, but there we are with the drama that we, can, we have not well enough communicated what is genetics. The idea is still for the idea of 20, uh, from the years 20 and the years 30, uh, the pure lines, the pure genomes, where the drama of a genetics evolved already for us, yes? So we, uh, molecular biologists show us how flexible a genome are. Uh, yes, uh, the, we have a lot of products of advantage, but it doesn't reach the market. And people see only a monopoly of uh, six multinationals. And that's what in Europe really disturbs 
and the wrong interpretation that is given, not seeing that these multinationals have already saved a lot uh, in the food production and could push agriculture at new levels. But no, the price tag that the green movement and the people who attack uh, science have put on us, that is tremendous. Uh, at the moment, the, uh, with the price of introduction of a new, uh, of a new GM crop uh, reaches uh, hundred, uh, ten and tens and sometimes hundred million dollars, at that moment, the multinationals cannot bring in the new ones and the small medium enterprises that really have to make the products and the developing countries where the needs is biggest for, the, for having the novel crops, they cannot do it. And for that reason, we have to do the communication. And for that reason, it's dramatic, the misinformation that cir circulates. And that's what we have to fight. So we have to see uh, w that in the world, we, uh, we have to create systems for communication. Uh, we know all the f false ideas emotionally that exist. And for many cases, Emotions are important for people's uh, reaction towards the challenges in society, but some can be dramatic, especially if we don't accept science and the technologies. So I am convinced that we will be able to do that, but we have to do it all together and see that it is the most important bottleneck at the moment. And I am convinced that we will, in the 21st century, have the plants and in a better environment if we talk together with our people that are now keen on only agroecology, on people who think that ecology is uh, really uh, the reason to block GMOs. If we do that the environment and talk with them, then we will can win and we can save the, and the challenges we need. Let me begin. I'm just going to stay here and make a few comments and make sure we leave uh, plenty of time for your questions. First of all, I'd like to thank the organizers and the uh, opportunity to be here. It's a real privilege to, uh, to, uh, to be here with a group that, uh, that understands the importance of agriculture and technology and uh, who uh, continues to be uh, part of the, uh, the mission to deliver the, uh, the vision that, uh, that Norm Borlaug had to, uh, to use science and technology to uh, address the, uh, the food needs and sustainability needs of the planet. Uh, it's also a tremendous privilege to share the stage with uh, two, of the, uh, two of the leading figures and friends and colleagues that have, uh, have driven uh, the, the science and, uh, and the opportunity to, to use these tools. I'm going to just make a couple of, uh, of points, and uh, and uh, then uh, we'll address your questions. I think you know, coming into the to this meeting every year, I think it, it for me it always reinforces just what an, an important time this is for uh, for agriculture. You know, if you look at the topics of this meeting, whether it's food security, water, the environment, biofuels. They're all central to the uh, to the topic of agriculture, but clearly, you know, in my mind, what, what's preeminent is uh, is the need to ensure that uh, food security is uh, is manifest uh, across the world, and I see that both through the lens of the uh, the, the importance of science and technology, the business opportunity, uh, but the need. You know, I think you know when you just step back and you think of uh, of where we are today, seven billion people on the planet. Over the next 30 or 40 years, that number will uh, will increase to uh, to nine or ten, and and create the uh, the incremental food demand. You all appreciate that as uh, as uh, global wealth increases, as diets improve, uh, that there will be incremental demand. You know, some of the analysis that that is for me the most stunning is, uh, you know, we'll see uh, a billion new consumers, you know, reach the middle class globally and create another incremental demand that if you look at it over the next 30 to 40 years, I think most experts agree, 
you know, we need to double food production to, to meet the demand to, uh, to feed the, uh, the growing world. And, and that's really where I think, you know, the science, the technology, the business interests of all of us come together to, uh, to achieve uh, that demand. And it's unprecedented, as you know, in the, uh, in the history of this planet. And so I think that's clear, unprecedented demand. That kind of leads me to the next point, which is the opportunity that the advances in science and technology, unprecedented demand without the unparalleled opportunity to innovate would, uh, would be, a, would be a, a, you know, a futile cycle. But what, what's exciting is the explosive amount of new technology that's possible. Uh, and I'm just going to limit my comments to a couple of points. I, th I think the first thing you would expect me to say is that it's all about biotechnology. Uh, I, I will tell you that the advances in science and technology across plant breeding, across equipment, across information technology and biotechnology are going to be part of that systems approach that, uh, that, that allows us to meet and exceed that need uh, for doubling. You know, as a company, I've had the opportunity to work with hundreds of universities, lots of small and big companies, uh, lots of, uh, of uh, not-for-profit and, uh, and environmental groups to meet that, uh, that need. Collectively, I think we've laid out a path where it's, it's clearly possible to achieve doublings or triplings in crop yields as we are fully able to deploy and use technologies to meet that need. For me, one of the most remarkable advances I've seen has actually been how the basic tools of biotechnology have fundamentally changed plant breeding. You know, 10, 15 years ago when we first got into the seed business, you know, the best and most sophisticated corn breeders in our companies were making decisions maybe based on 10 or 12 characteristics, you know, the size of the plant, the yield, the disease properties. Today having had the ability to sequence every single gene in a corn or a soybean or a cotton or a tomato plant, plant breeders today are now making their decisions on advancement based on thousands of genes. When I first joined Monsanto, it took us nearly six months to sequence a single gene. Today, with the technology, we can sequence a genome in a day. And that means that today, plant breeders around the world in almost all crops and species have the ability to literally breed gene by gene. So the biotechnology has enabled breeding to become molecular. At the same time, we're seeing the advance of biotech traits. I know there's frustration. I know there's challenges in their advancement. But think about it this way. Since 1996, biotechnology is now being used to, to, to deliver GMO seeds in 30 countries around the world. We're planting about 20% of the surface area that's farmable using biotechnology crops. And despite some of the challenges, it's been the most rapidly adopted technology in the history of agriculture. And today what we're seeing is continued advances in this area. The most popular corn hybrids in the U.S. contain eight genes. In our research laboratories, we're working on developing the 10 or 15 genes that will be needed to accelerate yields over the next several decades. We're testing not only the traits for improving resistance to bugs and weeds, but testing now traits that can protect crops against, against uh, disease and against drought. So the science continues to advance. In fact, I would argue that because breeding has become more molecular and seeds incorporate traits into that germplasm, breeding and biotechnology have coalesced like both sides of your hands. But that's just the beginning because the advances in genomics and the advances in information technology and computerization have come together and that creates the next paradigm shift for advancing technology. Today, whether you're a farmer employing precision ag, you know, there's more computational power in today's tractor than there were in the first spaceships. And that's giving farmers literally the capability to farm 
meter by meter and use that information technology to be more precise in their use of and positioning of seeds and chemicals. And again, just like we've seen biotechnology itself go around the world, we're seeing that same advancement in communication technology influence farming around the world. One of the best examples we have in India is every Indian farmer has a cell phone. The ability now to prescribe agronomic recommendations to warn in the advance of you know, insect flights and others to growers has become a, a global part of the incorporation of those tools. So the need is there, the advancement in science will enable that, and the last piece is this will have to be done collectively. It will have to be done through public and private partnerships. It will be done through the concerted efforts of multiple companies and parties that bring the advancements in science together. It will take a systems approach on a global basis. And if we do that and do that well, I'm absolutely convinced that we can increase the, the production of agriculture and we can do sustainable intensification in a way that meets the demand and the need and the societal values that we all share. So with that, I thank you again for the opportunity to be here. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, both our panelists have brought out clearly the opportunities that exist today for what is called in Rio, the shaping the future we want. On the other hand, I think it, it will be wrong on our part to deny the fact that there is a very great deal of apprehension all over the world, both developed and developing countries, on the risks and benefits associated with modern biotechnology. There is a growing perception change, not only with reference to biotechnology, but nano nanotechnology. A laboratory was set fire in Mexico. There is also the nuclear power. While the nuclear power, protagonists will say, it's a clean power. There is no greenhouse gas emission. Greenhouse gas emission. But nevertheless, after Fukushima, there's a lot of apprehension. There's a growing difference in the perception. This is why I think the Royal Society of London many years ago set up a committee called COPUS, Committee on the Public Understanding of Science. They have also extended it to a committee on political understanding of science. Now, a recent editorial in Science says that we need more work on the science of science communication. In other words, how to communicate to different groups of people what they have called the science of science communication. Now, we have hardly about eight minutes. A couple of questions from the floor, because a very important topic, shaping the future with modern technology. Hello. Who, will, who, who is there? Yeah. yeah please. Uh, I don't know if you then. are too familiar with the methodologies that you employ to make this transformation from the cell uh, to make these changes in the corpse and these things in the seeds. Which kind of methodologies you use to transfect or transform these cells? Uh, I, I, what I heard the question was what, what types of technologies are used for? Uh, methodologies, uh, lab methodologies. Yeah, like so, so I, I think just, just broadly, uh, you know, we use both the, uh, the tools of biotechnology for advanced breeding as well as for creating transgenic crops for GMOs. As, as I said in my introductory comments, in the last five years, plant breeding has really become molecular based on the known sequence genomes of all the crops and the ability to, uh, to use markers and, and tools to understand precisely the combinations of new genes that come together as we cross and breed crops. And then from a, a biotechnology perspective, we use uh, a lot of the tools that, uh, that scientists around the world are using with uh, agrobacterium and other methodologies to, uh, to uh, introduce uh, new genes into crops to both increase the, uh, the biodiversity of the, uh, of the plants, but also to give them you know, new attributes that aren't possible through breeding. Thank you. Which are your posture when you are doing a new seed, well, with some these modifications? Are you are trying to patent these seeds? I didn't, I didn't, I didn't quite understand the question. Making, take a patent, if you do it, patent on the seeds. Uh, in, uh, in many uh, of our technologies uh, where we've created new innovations and 
We have uh, we have taken patents out on the uh, the genes and the seeds, just like uh, you know people who work in the uh, information technology, the software area. Uh, as a company, you know we invest significantly and use that as a way of enabling us to create a return for our investment for our owners and uh, create value. Thank you. Next one, please. Next one. Yes, uh, the panelists uh, both have mentioned that there's a growing sort of competition and polarity between agroecological uh, farming practices and advocates and biotech. And my sense is it doesn't necessarily have to be so. Uh, but I do see that there's a tremendous gap between the kinds of resources and attention that's provided to encourage and promote and develop biotech solutions and what is left is bootstrapping operations to develop the kinds of agroecological sciences that could actually be a complement and partner. I look at the limited value uh, being put to soil health and fertility research. I see the very limited work being done in things like system rice intensive and its applications to other cereals. And it would seem to me that if there are a way to find a way of bridging the gap and actually having the biotech community be promoting the rapid development of agroecological solutions, we would actually be able to compound the advance and improvements in efficiency and intensification of production that is really possible if we were to use both technologies. But in today's environment, agroecological is very poorly understood and poorly advanced, and the biotech one is skewed in the opposite direction. And I'd be very interested in your comments on your willingness to provide much more aggressive support for agroecological solutions that could be combined at the farmer's choice with your solutions. Good. Well, let, me, let me just make a quick comment here, because if I said anything that gave you the impression that I thought these were antagonistic, uh, I would say it's exactly the opposite. Let me, let me be really clear here, because I think there's a general consensus coming together. If you, if you go through the three points I made, I, there's absolute consensus we need to double food supply. And it, I can remember sitting down with, uh, with, with Norm and talking about, you know, there's two ways to do it. You can either double the amount of land or you need to use the sustainable intensification of agriculture and farm those lands that can be farmed the most stably and, and increase production. And so I think the alignment uh, is recognize that the solution set for the future is people, there will be more demand, people will eat, and the best way to meet that demand is to, uh, is to take our lands and farm them more sustainably and, and to be able to intensify uh, their production. So I think there's an alignment there, and I would agree absolutely, and I tried to make the point, this is a systems approach. It won't be just breeding, it won't be just biotechnology, it won't be just computers, but it's going to be agronomy, the information technology, and the integration of all that together. And certainly understanding increasingly, you know, the productivity and the potential literally of field by field and meter by meter is going to require that type of, uh, of, uh, of intensity uh, in knowledge across both the genetics and the agronomy. I just, I couldn't agree with you more. Yep. Last question, well, last question. Okay. I'm sorry, there's only one. Yes, uh, we'll right. one, one of you. Uh, the question I had, <clears throat> excuse me. We look at the, the problem of marketing cost and making the GMOs and other forms of uh, farming inputs affordable to farmers, and we realize, as the first speaker said, that many GMOs have been too high cost to be implemented at the smallholder farmer level. At the same time, the ignorance that's been spread around uh, attacking GMOs creates a political environment that can also affect those cost variables. Uh, one, how do you interact with the political bodies, which are too heavily influenced by a number of different voices, which in turn, uh, have been one of the factors driving up the cost. And two, when we look at the issue of cell phones, which you mentioned, could you amplify your answer on the effective use of cell phone networks to be utilized in agricultural marketing to be able to overcome the problems of asset specificity and transfer and transaction cost, all of which would help the smallholder farmer uh, be enabled to not only utilize GMOs, but also uh, expand their markets to make sure they get a cost-benefit analysis in their favor for doing so. Thank you. 
Yeah, uh, just as a just as a general comment, you know, I, I mentioned you know in my introduction that you know despite all the challenges that 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 we're aware of, the the remarkable story I think is been the prolific adoption of the technology. 30 countries around the world are now planting uh, GMO seeds, and there are more farmers in India and China using this technology than anywhere else in the world. Uh, tremendous opportunity to extend uh, biotechnology seeds to small farmers and other crops, and there are many, many pilot projects. Uh, probably the one that, uh, that I'm most excited about is our WEMA project, where really it's the collaboration between our company, between CIMIT, between uh, you know, the African Agricultural uh, Technology Foundation and the Gates Foundation to bring you know, the latest technology in, uh, in drought into uh, you know, small farmers in Africa. The beauty, I think, of biotechnology is every farmer in the world knows what to do with the seed. And if you're using technology to enhance that seed through advanced breeding or advanced biotechnology, that can be utilized. And so the, uh, the uh, ability to, uh, to, to use this technology broadly is extensive. I think the key challenge, to, to your point, is you know, the involvement of regulatory agencies around the world as they're setting up their principles adds to the cost of development. But there's no doubt in my mind that the ability of this technology to reach growers globally is, uh, is inherent in the technology. Thank you. I'm very sorry we have come to the end of this. It's a very important question. I'm sure it will be ongoing all the time. I only want to say a word about the very fundamental question raised about agroecology and biotechnology. Are they uh, compatible or are they different? But you know, biotechnology is only a tool, and uh, therefore in agroecology, if you have the objective of cleaning up the waters, bioremediation will be needed. If you've got the objective of trying to improve the health of the people by overcoming hidden hunger, like micronutrient deficiencies, biofortification is an option. I would therefore say it depends upon what we want to do, which is the most effective tool, which is the most economical, effective tool, and reliable tool. And even in the International Forum, uh, E4AM, Forum for Organic Agriculture Movement, um, molecular marker-based selections and breeding, which is now becoming the most common method of plant breeding, you see marker, Dr. Freely mentioned, uh, that is uh, accepted for organic certification. Therefore, I hope instead of conflict, we'll have harmony and use all techniques, uh, old and new, in the most effective way. Uh, to achieve the single goal for which we are all committed, uh, namely how to avo avoid the hunger, the widespread hunger prevalent here. Thank you all very much. Thank you, uh, the two panelists. Please give them a big hand, the two panelists.